A business plan is the blueprint for your business idea. A business plan gets investors interested in buying into your company. But most of all, it helps you think through your business idea so well that you've worked out all the kinks and understand clearly what the value of your business truly is. Three, how will you make money 
specifically, what is your revenue model? A lot of people today say, oh, I'm gonna create this cool fandangled iPhone app where I'm gonna do this really cool thing and I'm gonna give to the community, which is great, but they haven't figured out how are you going to make money from it. So you have to have a very clear idea of this is how we're going to get money. The next step is, is the problem ready to be solved? You can have a great idea, but if it's 20 years before people catch up to you, like say the electric car, which is a great concept, but it wasn't ready in the 80s when it first came out and failed, it's not gonna work. And finally, how will it be sustainable? What are you going to do so that today you'll be in business and if things change tomorrow, you can still shift what you're doing? So those are five core questions that if you can answer specifically and directly, you'll put yourself far above most people. And then here's the key. You have to have an answer to all five questions. Four out of five, you fail. things that we did well, uh, it, it wasn't that we had the perfect business plan. We didn't do a ton of market research. It's that we dove in head first and we very quickly uh, made mistakes and learned from our mistakes. And uh, I think it, it's a matter of being critical of yourself and improving very quickly, which is a secret. And it's not about making a huge plan and sticking to it. Uh, that's just the way that we see it. It's, the problem with planning is that most of the time you have to change along the way and you should always be open to learning. Sometimes you have to modify your business plan. Sometimes you have to change it completely. Sometimes you have to change your direction and your mission. Maybe you thought you were going to do X, Y, and Z, but A, B, and C is more lucrative. For the bank, I had a few people look over. I had people from Nifty, and I had other nonprofit organizations that help small business owners um, review it and look at it over before I submitted it to the bank, to a bank loan officer. My best tip for writing a business plan, especially if you're doing it with a partner, is to do it together. Because every word, every um, product or idea that you put into that business plan, you should think about and put it on paper together so you guys would literally be on the same page. And as you grow, you'll always have that to look back on. Business plan is how you think through your idea and ask yourself all the questions. What you should be most focused on are your goals. Goals are different from plans in that they tend to be longer lasting. And even as, even as you make your mistakes and you change your path, your goals uh, should always remain intact. So I'd say pick your goals and then you can move forward from there. The most important thing in a business plan is the art of planning. But the plan, just planning and thinking about your concept, actualizing and realizing the concept of your plan is the most important thing. And I'll take anyone seriously, if they're not willing to write a business plan, I can't take them serious. Because how can you start a business off the whim? You can't, you have to plan, you have to think about your investments, about your plan, about your product, about your market. You have to think about you know, your, your, your product and where you're going to place it. You have to think about anything.
So my name is Shaina Zayn, not Shanae. <laughs> um, I'm graduating senior in international business and communication. Um, very passionate about health, um, health and well-being, and just taking care of oneself. I also went to FIT for two years before I transferred to Brooklyn College, and, um, and I do aspire to do something with fashion um, sometime in the future. So going back to the quote, um, I first learned um, to experience this when I moved out of my parents' house at the age of 19, and which was probably the most exciting thing I've ever done. Um, but paying the bills was probably the least exciting part. So, and that's when I had to get my first job, um, my first part-time job. So I took a first part-time job and it was terrible. I came to learn that I am very bad at doing something that I don't enjoy, um, getting paid a minimum wage. So I had to quit that job, got a second one, and a third one, the same story. Um, the same summer, I happened to go with a friend of mine to Six Flags and we wanted to get a henna tattoo. We waited for 40 minutes to get this tiny um, Hello Kitty tattoo for $20. And that's when um, the idea was like, beep, I was like, I can do this. Um, and so I went back home, did a lot of research, and um, read a lot of blogs, websites, searched people who are locally doing henna. Um, and it turns out that it's a very good business, but we don't have that many henna artists in the, in the tri-state area. So, I booked my first festival that same summer. It was specifically the African Street Festival um, that takes place on the 4th of July each year. Um, so I went, had my material, booked a, a, a tent, um, and I was very scared to be honest. I was very scared because I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if I was good enough. I didn't know if uh, people was, were gonna like my work, um, but I just went. So it was 94 degrees that day. Um, I sat there for two hours. Nobody came. So it was a bit a bit scary. I didn't know if, if it's worth it. If I should I should have probably just got a part time job at Dunkin' Donuts. At least it's air conditioned. Um, so. So I stayed. I decided I was not going to give up. I was going to sit there because I paid for the tent. I wasn't just going to go home. So I sat there for, for the next, for two hours. The third hour, someone walked up and, and they're like, um, what are you doing? And I just had to explain. And that's why I came up with that because um, it was a bit time consuming to explain to people what henna is, especially those who um, just put it up. It was a little closer that explains what the henna is about. Um, so, so I had my first client, the next thing I had the second client. Um, the next thing I know, my line extended that I could not see a tent. And surprisingly, the day went very well, and I made $500 that day, just in those last $5. Um, so I went home, and I was very, very inspired. I, I knew this is what I wanted to do for um, at least part time, because I go to school. So I did my research and um, it turns out that in order for you to succeed in this business, especially that you don't have a product to, to sell, you have to advertise for your business, you have to show people what you do. So I created a portfolio and that's when I met my first model, um, Angelica. She was an international student uh, who I met in my sophomore year. Um, and I, explained to her the idea and she was very happy to be a volunteer and um, and take some photos. I also had a friend of mine, I was lucky to have a friend of mine who was an aspiring photographer and who was a graphic designer. So he took most of the pictures that I have um, in my portfolio. This is the same um, person. This is at a um, bridal shower. This is at the African Street Festival. This is one of my um, royal gifts. By the way, this is the after state. So you get the henna done, it lasts, if you keep it on your skin for about two hours, and then when you take it off, this is the state that it gives you. And it stays for about two weeks. And this was, these were the bridemaids. Um, okay. 
So I wanted also to get into a little bit of technicality when it comes to the henna business. So you, when you do the henna business, you are doing it either at a street festival or a, a flea market, or you do it for private events and appointments. Um, both of them are great, but my favorite part is the private events, because when you do the street festival, even though it's an amazing gig, I probably made my highest, um, the highest amount that I made one time was almost $900 a day, and I did it for three days. So that was very great. However, you only do it once a year. So if you do the street festival, say if I do the BAM, I did the BAM, I did the African street festival, um, if you do that one, you only do it once a year. So you make good money now, but you have to wait until the next year. Like for instance, the BAM takes place in May, so I did it last year, and I have to do it this May, um, but that's it. However, when it comes to private events, people always have something going on. They always have some sort of celebration. They always want to have something, someone come in and do their henna. Um, so, yeah, and, um, and it, it's ongoing throughout the year while the street festival it only goes in the summer, warmer seasons. Um, now the challenges. Um, some of the challenges that I've come to experience in my five year experience doing the henna is that it's seasonal. So it usually takes place in warmer seasons, so May throughout October, but then it goes a little slow. And then you get calls from people who have weddings, who, but it's, it's not as often as in the summer. The summer is, is the best time to have a henna dog. Surprises. Um, so it's not always a pleasant experience, because when you get, a, point, when you get um, a call from a client, you don't know who to expect. Go to their house or you go to the event, and you're like, you could be nice people, you could be not so nice. You know, it could be like just some weird people. Um, and it happened a lot of times. Now, the third thing that I found challenging is online marketing. You have to have a presence online in order for you to survive um, in the henna business, because if, if people don't know about you, they won't call you, they won't find you on the, on the internet. So you have to have a presence on Facebook, for instance, you have to keep updating your Facebook, let people know you are alive, that you are doing you know, um, the business, that you're not just <laughs> um, so this is the third challenge. You also have people, when you start doing the business and people find you online, you get calls from listing websites who want you to use their service. And what you do is, when people search for the keyword henna and possibly Tri-State or Brooklyn or um, any other related keyword, you want to come in the top list, the search list. So, because if you don't, people will just click on the first or second and that's it and you don't have business. So you have to do that. And how you do it is you get listed by Google or by other advertisement um, companies. Now, things that I'm very grateful for are, or like some of the key success points that I learned throughout this experience um, is that you need to have passion um, in order for you to succeed at doing something. For instance, for henna, I come from a family who did henna as part of the culture. I'm from Morocco. Um, my great, 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 great parents did it, and my mother did it, and I enjoyed the experience growing up. So I have that passion. So the reason why I think passion is very important is when sometimes I get last minute calls, people want me to come and to get their henna done, and if I don't have that passion, if I know that I'm not going to enjoy it, I'm not going to go out of my way and go. So it takes that, you know, that little difference, patience. Um, it might not really work at the beginning, but if you don't wait, you're never going to find out. Um, and positive social skills. As I said, sometimes you come across people who are not so friendly, so you should never take it personal. Just do your business and, um, and stay positive. Um, lastly, my website. I created this website on my own because I didn't have any resources. And the person I asked to create the website for me said, this outrageous price, which I couldn't afford. So I had to do a little research, and I created this. Very simple. Good offense. There we go. That's Angelica. Such a sweet person, by the way. Um, so I kept the name of my business very simple and self-explanatory. And that by Shema. <laughs> so I have my portfolio here. This is one of my... Um, favorite moments. I did this pregnant lady. She was doing the next day. 
very touchy. I was like, are you sure you're going to do this? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Tell she was doing. <laughs> um, Good sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> now the services. This is what I offer right now. Besides the, the street festival, which I I have to go out and look for, but this is what I offer on my website. So that way, people when they look me up, I they find out I either do parties or go. Henna um, fact: A lot of people are not very familiar with henna. They know that henna is done. Um, for a celebration, but they don't know necessarily the facts. And instead of them calling me and asking me about these very simple facts, we could just like find out about them here. Um, and this is not how I started the website. It definitely was less, a lot less um, professional, more complicated. But uh, with experience and with calls that I got, with clients I interacted with, I um, personalized it. So we connect. This is um, my Facebook, and this is the company that I work with that works with me. Um, to advertise on Google. Um, one last thing that I want to mention is that getting into the henna business or any related henna or any related business um, that's, that requires talents, for instance, does not necessarily require tons of money to start. Um, for, example, for example, for my henna business, all I needed was a table, of course, some talents or like the knowledge how to draw, a chair. Um, comfortable chair because uh, you sit there for hours and a henna comb or maybe two after a year not really <laughs> um, and business cards these are very important because if you don't have your business cards you can do a fantastic job but if people cannot get in touch with you then you have to start all over and these are we also have the very first one that I created on Vistaprint the very free ones, <laughs> and then I got the professional ones later on. And of course, the last thing you need is a positive attitude. You want to go out there and have the courage to explore yourself and find what you are good at, because we all have that. We all have something we're good at, but we don't have the courage to explore it. So we need to take some time off, whether it's work, whether it's school, just take some time off and find what you are talented at and explore it. And it might be but we'll make you happy. That's, that's great. Right. Let, let me start off with one question, all right? Sure. Fascinating, just a spectacular job, both on the presentation and the website is super spectacular. Thank you. Um, what kind of talent artistically do you need to go into this um, business? When it comes to the henna business, you just know how, you just need to have a steady hand um, and the ability to draw. Is it a stencil or is it something that you um, need to draw? So I, as I told you before, I went to FIT and I was doing uh, fashion sketching because I always been fascinated with nice. drawing. Um, but the henna, you just need. This is sold at any local Indian store. Um, so you just need this, which is already pre-mixed, or you can make your own. I do make my own in the summer, but usually when I don't have time, I just buy these, which are as effective. Um, you need to have a steady hand and another hand, the person's hand, and um, patience, right. yeah. So this business has supported you on your own? Absolutely, I absolutely. Since I don't, 19 years old, you I'm not home. working right now. I just recently got an internship with uh, Moroccan Embassy, um, which is like my first official job. But before that, I, for the past four years, I lived on my own. Henna was the only thing that supported me. That um, just especially amazing. in the summer. Let's, yeah. let's hear And I game. I don't see it possibly as a permanent thing that I'll do because because of time. I might not have the, the enough time in the future to do it. Um, but I I I really enjoy it and if I need it to, I could always have that, you know, on the side to go back to and, and do. Um, or even if you want to, even yeah. if you want to expand in the henna business, you can start um, importing um, materials. A lot of people ask me, my clients ask me if I do sell the henna, if I do have the henna for hair, because it's very good for hair. Um, yeah, so sure, that could be, or I can make books of, of designs and sell them for people who are interested in learning.
So I had some of from being like a primary hair group. Like, I remember when I was a teenager. I think Madonna. Was like the rage. Madonna had doing? it the first huh? time. Madonna, in one of her yeah. video clips, she had all tattooed, and people found, found out that it was henna. And that's how it came out. You know, it became um, universal. You go to Star um, not Starbucks, you go to Six Flags, and it's, right. it's people, that's how they know it from Six Flags. But yeah, now. tremendous. Last semester, we had a student who did tattoo. He did, um, he did the uh, rub on tattoos yeah. at street fairs, and you know, it was a very that, similar story. Exactly. Very but similar, the difference? But it was seasonal. But he had exactly. three or four stands going down in Jersey. And he said he was making was it hundreds of thousands Square? of dollars just for the few months. He was in my class. Is he in Union Square? I think he was, Because I yeah. approached him one time. I was like, what do you do here? <laughs> right. So, um, you know, but the difference also... is that he uses Jaguar, which is um, the stain. I use natural. This is like my... My punchline, I'm natural, like I only use natural um, paste, which is healthy for you. You should try it. <laughs> Any questions for Charmaine? Just a compliment on your website. Um, Thank you. I was still on research right now. And, um, I'm trying to start my website for my business. And sure. The price is that would be appalled, 3000 4000 This is, this was zero. I mean, I did pay for the lip, for a dollar name, so I can have a domain, right. which is like a hundred dollars so a year. So where did you go to get this? this um, <laughs> it's not a secrets. secret, but I did yeah. a lot of research. It's I have. A, um, it yes, it's um, what is that? Um, Wix.com. Wix .com. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we talked yeah. about Wix. Yeah. Wix.com bit definitely. Wix.com has yeah. a pre-setup and uh, there are a few it's other. It's amazing. That yeah. Actually have that, but that is absolutely Thank spectacular. You. Thank okay. you. Okay. Very good. Thank Thank you. Very much. Okay, our guest speaker today is a 15-year uh, friend of mine that uh, started uh, in a business that's not really related to what he is uh, doing now, but certainly his skill set. Frank Rohn started out as an attorney and uh, then went into the investment world, uh, working for a firm that I had a small investment with called PhD Capital, and uh, worked his way up to managing, uh, I think, close to 100 brokers at one time and was their uh, leading uh, management person for many, many years. Uh, went on to uh, a career that he's going to tell you about in business that is absolutely fantastic. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Frank Barone. Um, I appreciate you giving me the time today. It's an honor to speak before you guys. As Ted said, um, I graduated law school in 96. Got recruited while I was in law school by a technology firm at the time in 96, right before the big tech bubble burst, uh, technology was just blowing up. And um, a good friend of mine who was actually, uh, I'll tell you also, I'm a 30 year martial artist. So a student of mine opened up a firm that was building network networks for large Fortune 500 companies, network integration. Um, and he said, hey listen, I'd love to have a guy like you on staff. I said, hey, I'm gonna be a lawyer. You know, I don't have any interest in really computers. I know enough to turn them on and off, and that's about it. So trust me, technology is where it's at. You can always hang a shingle outside. If you like, come in and join us. So I did that. I, I gave it a shot. And I said, you know what, you're right. I guess I can always hang a shingle, but let me, let me test this technology thing out. And um, I very quickly was able to rise within that enterprise to the chief operations officer, and we built a pretty big infrastructure in the United States and in Puerto Rico. Um, and that sort of started me off in the, in the technology world. Um, and very quickly got an opportunity on Wall Street for a company that was building trading technology for institutional companies. And, and that's how I sort of segued into a couple of gentlemen that Ted's very close with um, and got into the investment business. But um, I would say over that period of time, I, I guess I got my law degree, I have a, uh, a major in finance, a minor in marketing, went to Fordham University prior to St. John's Law School. Um, and then took some risks and got involved with some businesses that taught me some skill sets that you know every step of the way I've used in everything that I've done. We're able to get a market yeah. one, I appreciate that. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to talk a little bit about that today. And, and a couple of things that you know, I think are important for anyone to understand in business, I consider myself a bit of a serial entrepreneur. I've been involved in several different businesses and by the way, Probably the most important asset to have is what you mentioned, a positive attitude and an enthusiastic 
optimistic viewpoint that you can do pretty much anything that you want. And you guys hear that a lot. I guess, you know, you're out in college, you're going to hear it in school, you're going to hear it from your parents. But the reality is it's really true. The limitations that you put on yourself are the limitations you're going to have in this life. Once you take those limitations away, you'll find that opportunities open up all the time. And once you're in the game, more opportunities open up. It's the people that are standing on the sidelines and not in the game that don't wind up getting the opportunities. So a couple of points that I'd like to make. Risk and execution. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that business that Ted referred to. But I think those are the two most important things that I'd like to get across to you guys today or what you can take away from this. You're in a position right now, at this point in your lives, where you have the ability to take the most risk that you'll ever be able to take. As time goes on, as family comes into play, while life throws different curveballs at you, your ability to take these risks start to diminish. So I would suggest that right now, what you try and do is understand what it is you want to accomplish in your life. Think about those goals that you would aspire to go after and be willing to take some risks. It's okay. It's okay to fail, by the way. Right? They always talk about baseball. A great baseball player hits, what, 300? That means that 70% of the time, they don't get a hit. Only 30% of the time it works out for them. The best players in the world, right, the Hall of Famers, are hitting 300. Take the risks. And then, once you're willing to take a risk, understand that you must be, you must be willing to execute. Your life cannot be about how do you get the most money for doing the least amount of work. Let me repeat that. Your life can't be about how do I make the most money for doing the least amount of work. That may come later on after you've succeeded. But in the beginning, you need to be willing to put the work, the time, and the effort. You need to be willing to execute. People around you have to look at you as someone that can execute. Can I give you a job? Can I give you a project? Can I give you a function? And you're going to execute that to the end? Are you going to go A to Z? Or are you going to go A to like C? Right? 100% of the world has an idea. 100% of the world. Everybody has an idea. 85% of them have a plan on how to execute that idea. Maybe 3 to 5% of them have the actual ability to execute. And when I say execute, I don't mean just start it. Start it, get punched in the face drop down to one knee, fail a few times, restart it, fail again, start it again, and keep going until you get to that point. So I'm going to talk about a few of those things today that I think are important, some ideals that you should have in your mind. And it sounds to me you've gone through a lot of this yourself in your business, all right? Number one, prepare. Okay? Big old P, prepare. That means once you have an objective, Whatever that objective is, prepare to succeed. Study that industry. Study that sector of a business. Study that expertise, whether it's through school, it's on your own, on the internet, take an internship, put yourself alongside of someone that's an expert in it, listen to anyone and everyone that's had any experience in that particular business that you can possibly get. Become a sponge and absorb as much information as possible. Prepare for what it is you're about to go into. Then, be ready to test. Test. Test the waters. Okay, at some point you decided on a business to go after, and at some point you had to take that dip into the water, and you had to perform, you had to test, you had to take on your first customer, your first client, right? And during that process, in those initial testings, you're gonna find that some things are working and some things are not working. And I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more detail, giving you a specific example of the way I run my business today. But if you're not willing to prepare and understand the business that you wanna get into, well, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be business, right? This, this goes for anything in life. And then be willing to dip that toe in the water and test it. And that doesn't mean you have to spend millions of dollars. Test, put something out there. You have a business, you wanna try it, start with one person. Understand what adjustments you need to make because that test will ultimately demonstrate adjustments that need to be made. Those adjustments will include a process of elimination. Let me give you an example. I want to market, I'll tell you something we're marketing right now. 
my company develops a, uh, a pill that when you take this pill, the formulation is such that it will stop you from getting sunburned in the sun. And think about you know, the scalability or the marketplace there. Right? Imagine if you can actually take a supplement, a vitamin, and go out and not get sunburned and not have your body affected by the damaging rays of the sun, the UVA and the UVB. You no longer have to slather yourself up with, or your kids for that matter, with some of these um, lotions that can be pretty toxic. How many of you think that's one of the greatest ideas you ever heard? Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, if you, if you check out my first website for this, the testing website, sunassured.com. And by the way, I'm not here to promote that, I'm just giving an example. Um, <laughs> make sure you write that down. So we have this product that took uh, years of development. Um, a biochemist friend of mine approached me with us. He knows that my company is relatively sophisticated at bringing products to market. We spent a lot of time preparing and studying this market to identify whether there was a real demand. We thought that there is a demand, and now we're gonna start. So how do we test? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend a fair amount of money on some advertising medium. And what are the advertising mediums in front of me today? The most predominant one is the internet. Then of course you have more traditional methods, magazines, print. Print is a lot less impressive today because everyone's digital, but magazines still generate a fair amount of response from consumers. There's the radio, there's TV. So we decided after exploring all the areas, we were gonna try this on the internet and in the radio. And we identified a certain amount of money and we said that, well, that's the only amount of money that we're gonna spend on this test. And we developed three radio spots and we ran them for an entire month. In fact, it's still running right now. And explored all the different responses that we were getting from the consumer based on those ads. And we found that there were certain things we weren't doing that we thought we were doing. There were certain messages we were not getting across that we thought we were getting across. How do I know that? Well, I'm getting phone calls, I'm getting hits to my website, I now am generating clients and leads, and I have staff that is reaching back out to those clients and leads and understanding what triggered the event that they contacted us. We put a stimulus out to the market, we studied the response. Once we understood that, we made adjustments. And we're making those adjustments right now. And we're changing the way that radio spot reads, and we're changing the way that website is designed so that we can increase that response. And then what we do is once we understand that, we make our adjustments, process of elimination, I eliminate those parts of my marketing that are not working. And I focus my money on the ones that are working. Right? Let me say that again. If I'm spending hypothetically $10,000 on per spot on three radio spots, and I identify that two of those spots are not generating the response I'm looking for, why would I continue to spend money on those spots? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of those two spots. This time I'm gonna spend $20,000 on a spot that's working, and then I'm gonna add in new tests. All right, I'm gonna bring in more tests to the environment so I can scientifically start to figure out what's really creating the response that's triggering the return on my media dollar investment that I'm looking for. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. If anybody has a question, you wanna stop me if I'm going too fast, stop me, slow me down process of elimination in my adjustments, and then what do I do? I test again. I test again. Only this time, what I did was I spent a little bit more money on those advertisements that were generating a positive response for me. I eliminated the ones that weren't working for me, and I added in more tests. At some point, I'm gonna go through this process over and over again until I get to a sustainable level that now I am prepared to scale. Now I know this is working for me. Now I'm gonna go and spend more money or I'm gonna go raise more money. I'm gonna go borrow more money. I'm gonna do something to step up my efforts now. I identified something that works. I prepared for the marketplace I was in. I put together proper tests. I studied those tests, made my adjustments. I retested. Maybe I did that three or four times. Now I'm ready. I'm ready for business. I can take this thing to the next level. I can start to generate a business that is sustainable over the long run because I did my homework, I prepared. By the way, all along I did two things. I took some risks and I was willing to execute. I didn't just say, yeah, listen, this is a great idea, let's start it, let's talk about it for a couple months, 
Let's talk about it for a few more months. Let's try something real sloppy. It didn't work. Ah, listen, let's go for a beer and forget. <laughs> no, I got to step back. I got to figure out how to make it. I, I had a good plan. Right? A lot of times people, like I said, 100% of the people have a plan. They have an idea. Or I should say 100% have the idea, 85% have the plan. Just stick to that plan. It was a good plan. It had a good idea. Don't give up on it right away. All right? A couple of years back, a couple of years back, probably about 12 years now, when I was on Wall Street, a couple of colleagues of mine um, came up with a thought process to generate some side money, maybe a retirement vehicle for ourselves. We were all doing relatively well on Wall Street, but on Wall Street we were sort of um, prisoner to the ebbs and flows of Wall Street and felt that it would be great if we could develop a business on the side that maybe over a couple of years it could turn out to be something. Well, the concept was um, a topically applied, and do you mind if I go through this? Is a, is a topically applied vasodilator. Topically applied vasodilator. A vasodilator is something that allows the body's vessels and capillaries to open up, expand, and provide better blood, blood flow and oxygen flow. Vasodilator. Vasodilators are used in several different uh, products out there. A lot of uh, weightlifters and bodybuilders um, take some sort of supplement to help their body vasodilate so they can drive more blood and oxygen flow to the muscle that they're training and get a better pump. Um, Pfizer, Lilly, Bayer, they use vasodilators in a lot of their medications and their drugs, um, predominantly Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis. And each of these products do exactly that. They create a vasodilatory effect within the body that provides the desired effect. And we came up with this concept for a topically applied um, vasodilator. We thought it was an interesting idea. Eh, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Let's prepare for the market. And we spent about a year and approximately $100,000 of our own money with biochemists, because we're not biochemists, studying what ingredient base and what actives could be pro provided to a topically applied vasodilator. And there were many times where we didn't expect to spend on we said we'll put 10 in. And then we put another 10. Uh, somehow or another, we were looking at we were about $100,000 into this thing. And at some point, we said, okay, we need to now. We've prepared enough. We have something. We think it works. We've gone through all the major manufacturing labs out there. We know that we have a safe product. It's generating the desired effect. Let's see how we test it. And the first thought process, you want to make those? The first thought process was to use it in the sports nutrition environment. Use it for, again, um, weightlifters or athletes that were looking to bring better oxygen and blood flow to a targeted area to increase their capacity, better their performance. And at some point, one of my partners said to me, hey, why don't we use it for male enhancement purposes? And I looked at him and I remember saying, okay, let me get this straight, I'm an attorney. I have every license there is on Wall Street. I've run two broker dealers. We have hundreds of employees underneath us. On top of that, I own five martial arts schools where I teach thousands of children. And you want me to go out and basically market <laughs> this. Do you understand what this will do to our reputation? I said, get out of my office. I don't even want to talk to you anymore. And he walked out with his head down and said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought it was a good idea. And he walked out. And I remember that night going home and saying to him, my wife, I can't believe that he came to me with this ridiculous idea. And she looked at me and she said, it may not be so ridiculous. Why don't you just take a step back? And I looked at her and said, what, are you trying to say I have a problem? <laughs> I said, no, no, no. I think from a business perspective, it might not be a bad idea. Why don't you take a look at it? So I spent the entire night, when I say the entire night, at least, and I just went through the entire internet on everything I could find. And there were hundreds of pills that claimed to do all sorts of crazy things to the anatomy. There were stats on the growth of these prescription drugs that were staggering. On top of that, what I found probably most interesting was that the most widely sold drug on street corners was Viagra. It wasn't crack and cocaine and everything, it was Viagra. I said, oh my God, maybe there is something here. So the next day, 
I called him back. I said, oh, let's talk about this stupid idea that you had. We sat down, and me and him and one other gentleman, we put together this sort of plan. And the one thing I said was, I said, look, I'm going to tell you right now, if we do this, there's no way that I'm going to be looking at, am I on a, should I speed this up? There's no way, there's no way that I'm going to do this in any sort of lewd way. I don't want to be in, uh, in sex shops. I don't want to be in porn. I, I want to do this mainstream. And I said, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to an attorney. I spoke to a well-noted corporate attorney. Gave me the idea. I said, please, don't laugh at me. He looked at me and said, Frank, I think this is one of the most brilliant ideas I've ever heard. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. We came up with an ad. We prepared for the market. We came up with an advertisement. We spent $5,000 on an advertisement in a print magazine. It was a bodybuilding magazine. And by the way, this is a topically applied vasodilator that you apply directly to the source to generate the desired effect. Within 30 days, we generated $14,000. We had no idea what we were doing. None. We all worked full-time jobs on Wall Street through a website and through a phone number that we put out there that was tied to a voicemail system. We generated $14,000 in 30 days. So think about the return on investment. We spent $5,000, made 14. That's almost three times your money inside of a 30-day period of time. Over the course of 90 days, we made like five and a half times over. So we said, you know what? Let's call these people ourselves and let's understand why they, you know, why did they buy? What did they like about it? We did. We adjusted the ads. We tried it again. And every single time, we generated between three and five times our dollar. Do you know in that first year, we generated $1.6 million in sales? $1.6 million in sales, doing this part-time and on the weekends, something that we said, ah, maybe this will be a, uh, a retirement vehicle. Maybe we can make a couple of dollars on the side. We started to dedicate more energy, more time into it. Second year, $3 million. Third year, $6 million. Fourth year, every single year, we doubled to we were generating between 38 and 42 million dollars annually. On a product that started out, by the way, as one product, and then we moved into extensions, and then we moved into sports nutrition. Now we were, as I said in, in the beginning, we were in the game. And opportunities started to come to us left and right. People would come, hey, you guys are doing a great job on that. Would you consider using my formulation? Would you consider trying this? Or I'd like to try this opportunity with you. You guys are phenomenal at marketing. We became very sophisticated print, radio, TV, internet. We became very sophisticated FDA, FTC rules. We had to. We ultimately sold that company to a private equity group at a valuation of $40 million. That private equity group, by the way, when the economy started to tank, stopped paying attention to our little company that they had in their big billion dollar fund. The company started to drop a little bit, and we recently bought that company back for a million five. And now we're restarting a lot of those efforts again. But we were willing to do what? We were willing to take risks. We were willing to put our time and effort in and execute. And then we went into preparing, testing, adjusting, testing again, and then scaling over and over again. I know I don't have a lot of time. I came here late. I wanted to just express one message to you guys. Think about what it is that you're trying to accomplish. I don't care what it is. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a business again. What it is you want to accomplish in your life? Maybe it has something to do with your family, your kids, whatever. I don't know. Whatever it is, be prepared to take some risks early and be prepared to execute. Make sure that people around you see you as someone that can take the ball and run with it. Not someone that throws up smoke in the ears and talks and talks. Talk only goes so far. Be willing to execute. And when you execute, jump into the game, prepare, test, make your adjustments, test again, see how. If you could get nothing else out of this conversation, you remember those things, I hope, I hope they'll help you in something, even if it comes to school. Sorry, Ted, okay. that little uh, That was a tremendous presentation uh, by Frank. And uh, the things that he did tell you apply to any business that prepare the testing, test more, and then test more on top of that will help you avoid losing too much money. Okay, as you saw from his products, and uh, he's here today because we're talking about doing further business products overseas and other things. So this is just a very small piece of what Frank does in his normal day. He's been very modest, but he's done some really tremendous things. He's a very young guy, not much older than you guys. And, um, you know, and he's got a long, very profitable career ahead of him. So thanks very much for coming My in pleasure. today. Uh, any last minute questions for Frank? 
Yes, sir. Frank, how did you, uh, I just don't understand, like with somebody who works in finance, going to come up with like a pharmaceutical? Because I know most entrepreneurs, it's like a business idea, a mm -hmm. finance idea, but this is like something that... It's a, it's a great question because one doesn't match the other, yeah. right? As I said, the, the colleagues and the partners that I ultimately went to business with were all Wall Street guys. And, and one of them happened to be a bodybuilder. And he said one day, I think that there's a marketplace for this particular application because I know a lot of my friends that are working out in the gym, they're always looking for some way to get a better pump, some way to give them a better workout and get better results. And I like this concept. And I said, well, you know, I don't know much about that. I mean, I, I worked out, but I wasn't a bodybuilder. Um, I said, well, come back to me with some ideas. And he came back with this particular idea. And that idea went from the nutritional supplement side and sports nutrition to enhancement. And it just, it was one of those bridges that nobody expected to ever make, but it was there. It was there. And it started because we got together, three guys got together and said, hey, you know, listen, we're doing this Wall Street gig, it's great, let's come up with something else. Let's throw some ideas on the table. And we explored many different ideas. It never hurts to put together a little brainstorming session. You'll be amazed what you find out there. Yes. In terms of market, how did you guys market out such a product when you guys are all Wall Street people? Like, what exactly did you do to get people to, other than a great product, of mm -hmm. course, other than that, how did you get people to be so interested within the first 30 days? Well, great question. You know, first of all, I thought we had, I, I thought we had a, a market that created uh, an interesting demand, and the, the thing we did, needed to do was to create some urgency to that demand. Right? So we said, look, we can't run this business. We don't have employees. We don't have an infrastructure. We don't have an office. So how do we get a business off the ground? Well, developing a website is not difficult to do. We were uh, friends with some graphic designers. Back in the day, we didn't have Wix, by the way, which you guys, it's a great site. And I highly recommend you guys use it for yourselves. Um, I had a friend of mine develop a website. We purchased a vanity number, which is not a lot of money. A vanity number is just a, a phone number that you drive calls to. And we set that up to a voicemail system and had a fax line. We put an ad out that had, the ad basically said, are you having issues with this? Then try this, right? And we had a little coupon there that said, you can either send in this coupon, you can call this number, or you can go to this website. It didn't require any work from us whatsoever. Once the website was built and the phone number was attached, we weren't answering the calls, by the way. The calls were going straight to a voicemail system. And at night, when I got home, and I had a little infant in my hand, I was on the phone calling these customers back and said, hey, you called up with some interest in this product. Let me tell you about it. And that's how the process started. By the way, eventually we had a 150-person call center ourselves in Edison, New Jersey, wow. doing inbound and outbound. I have a question. How do you, um, during this like, business process, did you uh, encounter like a really like a serious like, roadblock and how did you overcome or, um, or, or did you? You know, I could tell you right now, I, I never, encountered a roadblock. Okay. I encountered thousands okay. of roadblocks. Okay. Um, we, we had no idea what the regulatory landscape was, which is intense. Once you're, once you're selling a product to the consumer base, you cannot just sell a product because you, you got a great product. Right? There's, there's safety issues, there's efficacy issues. You have to make sure that your claims are in line with what the FTC considers as a fair claim. The FDA is going to care if you're going to sell a cosmetic, which anything topically is considered a cosmetic, or a nutritional supplement. Are you making any claims that veer into the drug world? You know, there was so many times that we got stopped in our tracks. Merchant processing. Merchant processing. We think this is great. We got a merchant processor. Right? The merchant processor gave us a, uh, and Ted, you know this better than anybody, gave us a limit. $10,000. We thought that was awesome. Well, don't forget, we generated $14,000 in the first month. The first month, we generated 1.6 in the first year. Merchant process, we blew them up left and right. They, they shut us down at some point. You're capped out. You're capped out. So we had to figure out how to work with the merchant processing relationships and the affiliates that are out there and the associations to demonstrate our credit worthiness to get our limits up, right? Because the banks are afraid. They're afraid that the chargebacks is not going to work and that he'll be out of business and they'll take the money and the banks won't be able to come back to him to get the money. So mm -hmm. that's why he's saying that the merchant accounts are such an important thing in the direct response business. Like it really is. And I'll tell you what, I didn't realize back then that a credit card purchase 
is really a, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a loan that the bank is giving you. Not, if you're the purchaser, not you, but me as the vendor, the merchant, I'm getting a loan because at any point you can apply for a refund or a chargeback. They already paid me the money. If I went out of business, they lost that money. So they cap you, right? And they put restrictions on how you can process your, your, your credit card. We didn't know anything about that at the time. Um, scalability in terms of the formulation itself. We were literally, we were so afraid that people were gonna steal our formulation that we were buying the actives from four different manufacturers, having them sent to our homes and mixing this stuff ourselves. I'm not exaggerating, all right? And we had a machine that we poured this stuff into tubes and this, the machine heated, heat sealed the tubes and we sent them out ourselves. We had to figure out, okay, now what? Now we have to find the proper manufacturing um, resources that can do this all themselves. We have to find out the, the proper fulfillment methodologies. We can't keep shipping out of our house. Every step of the way, we encountered roadblocks. Every step of the way, there were 10 reasons why we should stop. Every day. And I can't tell you how many people tried to copy us. How many people saw that we were making money and tried to copy us, but they didn't have our, our fortitude. They didn't have our passion. They didn't have our willingness to keep going, and they just fell off to the wayside. Great, that last question. Very quickly. Hi, Frank. Hi. I just wanted to thank you for a very informative um, tip. I think that you gave us also a question. Um, you said once you take risk, many doors open and you get opportunities. Mm -hmm. How do you stay focused and not distracted? How do you know which one is the one? Well, that's, that's probably one of the greatest questions you could possibly ask. You know, make sure that the path that you're going down is predetermined by you as to what you're looking to accomplish. If for your business, for example, you want to stay within that medium, then don't let somebody drive you into a business where you're selling apples and oranges, right? Stay within those opportunities that allow you to capitalize on the momentum that you've already created for yourself. Um, you know, if, if, we're, if we started to develop a business within the nutrace, nutraceutical and cosmeceutical markets, uh, I'll give you an example. Somebody came to us with the opportunity to import lumber overseas. And one of my partners said, I want to do this. I told him, thanks, but no thanks. That might be a great business. I don't know, but we're doing this right now. So show me opportunities that are within the nutritional supplement or the cosmetic markets and we'll go for it. I don't want to do something that's going to distract me from our objectives. All right, somebody came to us and said, I want to open up a string of car washes. It's a cash business. Wonderful, that's great. Go buck wild with yourself. I'm not interested. <laughs> show me something that's going to stay within this lane. Now, you give me an opportunity, let's say, for example, I have a formulation to do X. You have a formulation that can do Y. Well, let's sit down and talk about that because I've already built a machine that allows me to market s certain products within a particular category. Now let's see how we can grow upon that. For example, Sun Assure. All right, Sun Assure has nothing to do with that market. However, it's a nutritional supplement that I can market within the machine that I built over 12 years. And I could do it relatively easily because I already have the network of media buyers, fulfillment houses, merchant processors, all the things that go online with that. Right, so that's an opportunity that I'm going to want to capitalize on. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, thanks very much. Just spectacular. Just spectacular.